Hello there, dear listener. A quick word of warning before we start. We would not recommend listening to this episode while eating, as some of the content you're about to experience may ruin your appetite, if not worse. Consider yourself warned, and enjoy Tapestry of Suburbia. It is still hot. Very hot outside. So when you meet... Margot, you've been working outside all morning, and so your dress sticks to your skin a little. It's not unpleasant, but you feel like you've been working hard in this heat. Doug, however, looks fresh as a daisy. Beyond, well, above the waist at least, and thankfully you can't see below it. He's in a crisp shirt and blazer. Fresh tie. Looks like he's just stepped out of the shower. The park. The park is always a good place to meet. And after all, Margot, you can't go to the Copper Castle. You know Mackenzie and Daniel will be there and you don't want any kind of running with them after earlier. Ah, take a seat. Make myself comfortable. It's a good summer's day. Granted, it is a little hot, but that's not a problem. And I wait for Margot. Meantime, just peeking back at my sandwich. I'm looking forward to eating that. I don't do late. So, maybe five minutes prior to the point of um, the scheduled time, uh, I will arrive. Knocking back half a bottle of some high-end alkaline bottled water that's still, like, sweating on the outside of it. I look hot. Margo, (laughs) heat getting to you? Mr. Kennedy, you look stunning this morning. I always do try my best. Please, take a seat. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, everything going okay on your end of things? Again, we're all good on the permits. We're all good on the stands. Uh, I'm guessing you're all good on the, uh, you know, security. (laughs) Yes, there are a couple of shifts getting towards later in the evening that haven't been filled. I'll pick them up myself if I have to, but I think I can nudge a few unwilling participants into the security of our neighborhood. Hey, not to be too forward, but how's Deborah? Deborah? Mm -hmm. She's absolutely fine. Why do you ask? Is she? Yes. Why wouldn't she be? I smile. Hmm. No, I... And I'm trying to figure out a delicate way to refer to that night three nights ago without saying anything really without acknowledging anything after our outing I went back to your home to pick up Izzy and Isaac Deborah was she was peculiar I frown just a little I nod She was acting a little strange on that day, but it's understandable she was aware of what was going on. At least as much as she needed to be, I say, lowering my tone at that point. I nod patiently, understandingly. Okay. She didn't say anything to you about that night? About me picking up the kids? Well, no, she said you came over, of course, but nothing more than that. And, well, we haven't really spoken much more on the matter, which is a good thing, because, as we've said, we really want to keep everything quiet on that end for the moment. Although, I lean forward. Have you got any news for me? Seen anything on the uh, cameras? Got any leads? And That is a great question. While combing through this footage, reallocating, reprioritizing, trying to follow certain leads over the last few days, have I found any additional leads or footage? So you didn't find anything concrete, uh, nothing that directly showed a hunched over figure shuffling along looking predatory. If you had, undoubtedly you would have acted before now. The only thing that did strike you, and there's obviously a lot of footage from the various cameras that you've situated around town, was you did see in the alley that runs between Eli Jenkins' house 
and the house of uh, Councilwoman Betty Hanratty. Uh, a what looks like a person jumping over a fence. Now, that's not unusual in itself. Kids do that all the time. Sometimes people get themselves locked out of their house. One of you witnessed something very similar. And in fact, that was you, Margot. Uh, and now that you're thinking about it, that footage, that footage you saw, yeah, that was Eli's house and Betty's house. Uh, when you were walking your kids, uh, they, that figure you saw, yeah, 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 that, that's, that's what it is. Now, again, it didn't look like the figure on the footage that all too clearly showed him being attacked by Sally and then pursuing Sally and Fiona. Uh, but it was something. Something notable, but not worth bringing up at the time. There are a couple of things. One, I would argue, is a bit more significant, but um, here's the second and I will reach into the pocket of this sundress and pull out the phone. I have that uh, clip already pre-captured. Um, if you look here, this is the fence between Eli Jenkins and Councilwoman Betty's home. You'll see right there um, a figure jumping the fence. It doesn't meet the description of of the individual we saw before, but... It's the only thing that I've seen so far with combing through everything that even even began to strike me as weird. I let out an irritated sigh. It's not much to go on, is it? God damn it! I know we need to focus on this after the bloody parade, but it's annoying me. He could be anywhere. He could be getting away. Whoever this person is. I have the murder weapon. I stumbled onto it on the way home that night. For some reason, I haven't told or shown it to Josh. I blink a little, and then I nod, and I just say, No, I get it. Josh can sometimes want to take the lead on things, but as we've seen in the past, sometimes he's not always <laughs> on the ball. Not like you and me and Kevin, no. But you've made sure it's somewhere secret and safe, right? For now, yes. I didn't feel comfortable showing it to him or telling him about it, but it feels safe to tell you. Thank you, Mark. And I get it, it's not nice to hide things from those we love, but again, sometimes we need to. It's just the way things are. No, you keep hold of that. And I guess for now we just need to wait. It's irritating, but I don't think there's anything more we can do till at least after the parade. Not that I can anticipate or guess at this point. And believe me, I've been rattling my brain on what more we should or could be doing. I've been beating the pavement all morning, posting flyers for the parade and doing what I can to control the temperature of our little ecosystem here I don't know I'm thinking by this point this guy must have flown the coop so to speak what the hell are we going to do then I don't know Mr. Kennedy I don't know have you heard from Kevin hmm no I haven't uh I don't know, he's been acting a bit strangely. I guess he's got a lot of family issues going on, but I suppose that's Kevin for you. We'll have to see what we can do to help him out, I say, and I reach into the brown bag to take out my sandwich. As you, your hand touches your sandwich, your smartwatch goes off. Wouldn't you know, it's Kevin. He's messaged both you and Margot. Looks like he is uh, wanting some kind of meetup. Huh. Well, I'll send back a message telling you we're in the park. Well, speak of the devil. There's Kevin. <laughs> I laugh. Now there's nothing between you and your sandwich. I take it out and begin eating it. Could you make a fortitude roll, please? 
That is a five. You immediately throw up. You take one bite, and that's enough to make you gag, wretch. The breakfast you've already eaten, along with the contents of your mouth, barely gets to touch the back of your throat. Just gushes from your mouth and nose. You find yourself spitting, retching violently on the grass. Spatters your trousers, your shoes. You are very lucky to not hit Margot with it. It is like you've suddenly come down with something like norovirus and it's just riddled your system and boom! It's exploding out your front end. You can only hope that it won't affect the other. I am horrified, I am embarrassed, I retch and I retch, does it start to cease? And then I kind of, in all this, kind of find myself dropping the sandwich and I look at it, what the hell is going on? I think to myself. Margot sees it through clearer eyes than you. Perhaps she smells it. Because after all, the only smell you have is vomit. And your eyes are watering. You can't see clearly. Margot, though, you see the sandwich dropped to the grass. It's spilled open. One half open. You can see a slice of lettuce there. A couple of slices of tomato. Okay, okay. Looking like a normal sandwich. Then there's some pasty-looking meat in there. It looks greyish-green around the edges. It you think you can see a nipple on it? Yes. This looks like someone's breast tissue. I mean, it's... There's not really much more that needs to be said. Aside from the fact it's most certainly not fresh. Mm. Margot... You can make a roll to act under pressure if you want, but the natural inclination would probably be to stand up and back away from that. Let's roll that act under pressure. 15 on the dice with a 1 on coolness, so I'm going to be 16. In that case, you can choose. You choose how you respond to this sight. Impulsively, I need to step away from this. Doug is obviously very ill, and if I'm seeing what I'm seeing correctly, embedded in between sandwich spread, lettuce, and bread, that's that's impossible. But I'm seeing what I'm seeing. So my, my attention splits into um, two very specific directions. One is being as much of the, a helpmate as I can be to Mr. Kennedy, and the second is going to be getting that out of view. So if they're if they had been sitting on a bench, I am going to do everything I can to put my foot onto that sandwich, grit my teeth where I, I try not to imagine what's beneath the bottom of my sandal, and I'm just going to push that at least back underneath the bench so it's not in public view. Someone else is going to come over here. It's a park, and he's he's vomiting so violently. And if I feel comfortable that I at least have. I at least have that under the bench. I'm going to immediately turn my attention um, to Doug, which is going to be just more or less providing physical affirmation and as much calming tones as I can until he finishes riding out this entire evacuation. Doug, your your taste buds are well about as clear as you can. You grab the alkaline water bottle that was on the bench next to Margot to swill out some of the flavor flush out your system that was rotten whatever you just bit into you don't know what it was but it was it that was definitely rotten it was like it had a perfect seal around it and as soon as your teeth went through it it just burst with putrescence uh, that hit you right in the back of the throat and somehow told your stomach no 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 you don't want to eat this and yeah that was the outcome I clutch at Margot for support. I need support. I continue to throw up and I start trying to 
hold it down a little, thinking to myself that I didn't swallow whatever the fuck it was. Why am I reacting this way? And then I kind of just say, Can you get me home? I need to get, get home. Tell Kevin we need to go, go in my house. I can't, can't be seen like this. And I start agitated looking around because I am horrified that people are going to see me vomiting all over my Sunday best. I'm going to come in close. I'm going to wrap uh, an arm around the back of Doug's um, the back of his neck, so I- I'm holding onto the side of his head, and I am going to whisper into his ear, did your wife make that sandwich? Yes, she did. Doug, you're not going home. Come on. Uh, Let's go. We're going back to my house. I frown, but I'm a little too weak to argue, and I'm just keen to get out of sight, so I just kind of nod and let her escort me away. If I can get him up onto the bench or at least stable, I am going... Oh, God. Oh, God. I have to put my hand on that. Um, am I lucky enough that that brown paper bag came with... Oh, the brown paper bag. I am going to rip that bag in half where I can use it almost like uh, a tortilla or a taco of I can grab that sandwich without putting my hands on it. Amazing to think of it in that way as you do so that, yeah, this is a little like wrapping up a slice of meat and a taco you've got the salad there mm. as well mm. but you are not compelled to take a bite yes of course you can do so i will uh, i'll grab it i will look over to doug and then i am very very quickly going to pull out my cell phone i see that missed call from josh that i still haven't responded to he didn't try calling you again so either it's not important or he just doesn't care. Well, nowadays it's probably both. And I'm immediately going to call Kevin. Kevin, you're already on the way to the park based on the message you got. And so you pull up. And just a short distance away you can see the ashen-faced Doug and being supported by Margot. I'll park the car and I'll rush over there. I need to talk to them and what am I seeing Doug doesn't look to be in good shape you can see a hell of a lot of spatter all over the grass Uh, it does look like someone has been violently sick here and putting two and two together looking at Doug's pants and shoes and the state of his face it's probably him Margot is carrying something in her hand I'll move over to them. Are you all right, Doug? Let's just get back to Margos and we can talk there. It's fine. Just some, just just a big misunderstanding. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. Let's let's do let's do that. You can ride in my car if you want. Otherwise, I'll see you over there. No, take us, please, Kevin. He doesn't need to be seen like this. I'll whisk them away to uh, my car then and try to make sure that no one sees Doug in his current state. I I wouldn't want to be seen in that state. He's my friend. Yeah. And you do. You drive him. You drive them both back to Margot's house as she requested. Mercifully, Josh isn't in. Must be at the sheriff's station. So that does give you some time. It gives Doug some time to wash up. He's the same size as Josh, well, a little smaller, but uh, he could change his pants if he needs to. Not much that can be done about the shoes, unfortunately. You don't think Josh would mind if I borrowed some of his clothes, do you? I can't. I can't be walking around like this. God damn it! No, you you can't. It's fine. Take what you need. I'll reconcile it with Josh later. And I will temporarily part from the other two, attempting to get some clean clothing on and clean myself up, because this is mortifying. While Doug is out of the room, if I may, can I bring Kevin over to... No, she's not going to put that on her kitchen countertop. She never wants to see that associated with anywhere where she prepares food. So, um, an end table. That end table that I've been meaning to replace uh, for the past couple of months. That that end table. I'm going to move that wrapped brown paper 
bag taco thing over to that end table. Clear it. Kevin, can you let me know what you see in this? Sure. This is what Doug ate before before he was sick. Um, all right. I say at this quite strange request, but then again, all right. Um, and I'll look. What, what is it that I see? I turn my back the second he peels back that paper. It appears to you to be human skin on human flesh with a small nipple. Uh, Based on its coloration, it's probably been decomposing for a little while, but it's clean in the sense that it appears to be washed. Uh, It exudes a rotting smell. You're no biologist, you're no doctor, you're no coroner. But based on the... And you kind of have to take a breath as the gears grind in your head. Based on the size, the shape, this probably came from a child. And I immediately start thinking about, could this be Fiona? I mean... And I, I take a step back in horror at what I'm seeing. You see it too? It wasn't just me? Oh, it's very real, Margot. But it's impossible, <laughs> right? I mean, why would it be here? It, it, I think it's Fiona. What's happening to us? What's happening here? Have you smelled smoke recently? Like, really smelled it? I bite my bottom lip and nod, fighting back the tears that are filling up my ducks. He came to my house, Marco. Mr. Gazinski. He... He wants... I think he... He's back to... To get payback or... To punish us. He's back to punish us for what we did. No, no, baby. That's impossible because he's dead. He is dead. He is dead. We made fucking sure of it. He is dead. Yeah. He is. I can't explain it, but he's there. And... I keep seeing him. He keeps appearing in places he's not supposed to be. Fuck. Places he can't be. If you're seeing him too, then it's not just me going crazy. And and it's real. I, I, don't, I can't explain it. Maybe we can see what, what Doug thinks. Maybe he can tell us that all this is just us, us being crazy and, and everything's fine, actually. Okay, yeah, let's wait for Doug. And I don't wait for Doug. I scream upstairs for Doug like I would be screaming for one of the twins to come down who were upstairs playing too long and they were past due on a chore or it was time for dinner or they should have turned that television off 20 minutes ago. I do my best to finish up cleaning myself and hear this yell and I get very confused because the other two are acting very fucking strangely like... I'm annoyed. My wife clearly put some out-of-date fucking ingredients in the bloody sandwich, but I don't see it as being that big a problem. I'm more mortified about publicly throwing up, and I begin heading down the stairs saying, Okay, I, 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 okay, I was trying to get ready. Uh, w- what's the big deal? I know you don't want to look at that um, sandwich again, um, Doug, but um, and I try to just stay as in control of my faculties as I can be as I try to remain as normal and, and as a matter of fact as I can be it appears that uh, the sandwich contained parts of Fiona I stare at Kevin and then laugh a little saying 
Kevin, we don't have time for jokes. And I go over to look at the sandwich for myself, expecting to see the rotten meat. Make a willpower roll, please. Nineteen. Wow, in that case, I think, in a strange twist of events, Craig, your stability, you can uh, knock yourself back up one. Because somehow you can perfectly rationalise this, and I look forward to seeing how you do it. But when you when you look at that meat, and you blink, you don't back away, you don't gulp, you don't think, Ah, oh, okay, my wife is a fucking psychopath. None of that. You somehow internalise it, make sense of it, and are prepared to move on. How do you do that? So when I actually look at this flesh, does it actually, to me, even look like what they're saying? Or to me, does it just look like a, any old bit of ham or turkey or bacon? Gone off, clearly. No, you are seeing it with crystal clarity. About the only thing, if you accept that you are essentially deluded, is that your father was a butcher and occasionally he'd bring back pork belly you remember pigs sometimes had pronounced nipples they didn't look quite like this they didn't look like a human nipple no that's, that's true but it, it, it's not impossible is it it's it's not impossible this is some some ham that, that just has an extraneous part attached maybe maybe that's what you're telling yourself she was saying she wanted to try out new things. She must have ordered some sort of foreign meat from somewhere and put it in my sandwich, and it's clearly gone off and giving me a very bad stomachache. But I kind of just look at it and then just glare at Kevin and say, Kevin, calm down. What are you... Fiona, this is not... This isn't a little girl in a sandwich. What the fuck are you talking about? No, it's not a little girl in a sandwich. It's a, it's a part of her. Um, someone has clearly um, found the found the body I say with a low voice and well you're saying someone has gone to a certain part of the woods dug up a corpse chopped off a very small piece of it and then snuck around to my house where my wife was making a sandwich this morning and snuck it Kevin Kevin Margo help me out here Kevin Kevin you need to calm down you need to calm down Kevin Doug have, have you smelled smoke recently I pause, and then I say, I s- s- smelling smoke is a thing that happens in life, yes. No, not, not like that, like really. Like, you remember? Like back then. Back when we protected the community. That type of smoke, Doug. I frown very heavily, and internally this helps even more. I know exactly what's going on. Kevin is having a breakdown, and he's remembering the past. Kevin, I definitely remember what happened in the past, but that was the past. We were all kids. I've We've gone over this before, buddy. We were just kids, and we <laughs> made a little mistake, but it all worked out for the best, and we've moved on. Margo, help me here. Doug, I'm so sorry, but you're on your own on this one. What? We are both seeing and smelling smoke. That smoke, that type of smoke that is only cultivated when you are burning flesh. We are both seeing Nikolai Gazinski. We are both seeing what's in this sandwich, Doug. I don't understand why you are the anomaly of the three of us. Maybe that's because I've always been the one who can keep it together. God damn it, you two. I get it. I get it. What's going on right now is... <sighs> Stressful. You are both falling apart on me, though. This isn't like you two. God damn it, Doug. This isn't just stress over the goddamn parade. This is... This is not... I know that, Kevin. Shut the fuck up. Kevin, shut the fuck up. Buddy. 
I go over and I attempt to pat him on the shoulder. I'm furious with him, but I remember that he does need encouragement. It's, it's berating someone like this doesn't help anyone. Buddy, it's more than that. But, oh, I'm sorry, what, what, what? So, wait, so hang on, okay, okay. Let's, you two for a second. The spirit of a dead man has come back from the grave to haunt us, uh, like a horror movie? That's, that's what you two are saying is happening, because that sounds so much more logical than, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and that sort of thing. I mean, it's in the book. It's the devil. It has to be. That's the only explanation that makes any kind of sense. I mean, that can happen, I guess, but... We've sinned. We are sinners, Doug. And now we're... Now we're paying for that. We've gone against the word of God. And, and, and we have to repent. We went with the word of God, and we did make a mistake. I admit that. I admit that. Deep down... Perhaps part of me still deludes myself into thinking that we never actually meant to kill the man, just scare him off. And that was why it was confusing back then when I remember and thinking, why did I block the door then if I wanted that to happen, but... As you have that thought, Doug, the back door to the house that you were leaving open just to let some air come through, Margot, it slams shut. All three of you notice... And this isn't just a feat of the wind. It slams shut and noticeably locks. What the hell's going on? It is at the exact moment that you're thinking about when you blocked those doors. I frown and eager to perhaps escape this conversation with my two friends losing their minds. I just go to open that door that's closed, because that is unusual. Yeah, it's it's locked in your hand. I mean, it should be as simple as flicking the catch, surely. I do so. For some reason, the door stays locked, Doug. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you to make a coolness roll. Are you going to just walk away from this door, or are you going to start rattling it furiously? Eleven. Not a failure. No. You keep trying it, you know, you put your shoulder to it. You actually hurt yourself a little when you do. You find yourself rubbing your upper arm. But no, on an 11, clearly Josh hasn't been keeping up with the DIY because this door is jammed. Margot, you've got a problem with your door here. Uh, look, look, you two, look, you two, you need to calm down. I need to go home. I need to deal with my wife and I yeah you need to get this door fixed and I attempt to walk out of the room and try another door you go to the front door likewise jammed shut and now all three of you smell smoke you can see where it's coming from Margot it's coming from a perfectly natural place well kind of it's starting to pour out from the oven but the oven's not on. The smoke alarm starts beeping furiously. You've got one of those new ones that doesn't just alert everyone in the house. If it keeps beeping for 20 seconds, it's going to alert the local fire station. That's why you always have a wooden spoon just underneath it on the, uh, on the kitchen table so that you can reach up and bleep the damn thing. That first door slammed shut, and I know that I heard it lock. I heard the lock engage. Doug is doing what Doug does, which is trying to justify the fuck out of every situation. I could have tolerated that. I, I could have tolerated that. But I watched that first, that second door slam, and I heard it lock. And now there's smoke. In my mind, I 100% know reach for the wooden spoon turn off the smoke detector you don't need law enforcement and you don't need a scene and you don't need anyone at this house but may I make a roll to see if she can actually get that far because she is highly I am highly upset right now keep it together 
make a willpower roll. Uh, an 11. I mean, you are twitching. You are biting your lip. You're biting your lip now to the point that it is bleeding. But that isn't a failure. You are having to force yourself to do what you need to do, what you would normally do. To essentially clench your eyes shut and power through this mentally and go for that wooden spoon to switch off the alarm. You don't want the fire brigade here, do you? No, not right now. We couldn't collect our stories together if we tried. We're out of alignment. We collectively don't have our shit together. Not to mention you have a piece of human meat on your end table. God, off of a nine-year-old. <sighs> As you reach up towards the smoke alarm, Kevin, you can see all of this. This is all within a matter of seconds. Doug goes to the back door, is rattling it, puts his shoulder to it. As he passes back through the kitchen, smoke starts pouring out of the oven. Margot freezes, starts gnawing on her lips, starts jabbing at the ceiling. The smoke alarm, you can see, it's a very discreet-looking smoke alarm. Quite a, quite a thing that you think uh, Laura would appreciate. Is She's poking at it with the wooden spoon. What is? What are you doing, Kevin? Margot, do you have a fire extinguisher? And I'll, I'm looking around to see if she has one. I mean, we're supposed to have them. Um, um, there's, there's one under, under, under the kitchen sink. And I'll begin moving over there. Hopefully I'll be able to access that, but I'm not sure. That's right where the oven is. Yeah, as you pass by, you are bombarded with an intense heat that should not be. Again, this oven is not on, but somehow it's like it's open, like it's a furnace. Like as you pass by, you actually have to take a step or two back. It's not enough to burn you, but you do feel scorched. Your skin feels tight and raw as you pass by. You can get under the sink and to this fire extinguisher. And and I, I begin pulling out the the hose and and, and taking out this the pin and I'm about to use it and then, and then I remember but it, but it wasn't real at, at home. I'll just begin backing away and I'm I'm just looking at the fire, just looking at the flames, and, and I'm frozen. You are, I would say, willingly losing a couple of stability down there. Uh, let's put you on unfocused. You stand there, frozen, fire extinguisher in hand, unable to blast the source of the the origin of this this fire, this heat, this smoke. You're not even sure if there is a fire there. Back to you, Doug. You're at the front door now, wrestling with that. This is getting ridiculous. I go to a window. Surely I can open a window. You can. You can open a front window. Then I go and just open a window. You can see some of your neighbours on the other side of the street. They're just standing there watching you. You recognise uh, Christopher Duval. He, he works at uh, one of the local charities. It's a, it's a dog's home. He's standing there with three dogs on three leads, just, just watching... Margot's house. You can see Frank Cobb, he's uh, one of the neighbourhood watch chiefs, works with Margot quite closely. He stood a little way down the street, but he's also just there, upright, staring at the house. I am caught off guard for a moment, but then I attempt to smile. I attempt to make light of the situation as best I can, and I just say, Hey, y'all. <laughs> Funny thing. Margo's front door's uh, got a little bit of a problem. I don't suppose someone could come and help try and open it from your end, could you? And I smile, trying to hide the anxiousness of the situation behind me, because, again, I can't afford to look like I'm having a nervous breakdown in front of all the people. Make a charisma roll, please. Fourteen. It's almost as if your words flick a switch in Frank Cobb's head because he was watching, I wouldn't even describe it as passive, he was watching with enthusiasm, you think. There was a slight smile on his face, he was 
you you were only realizing that one of his hands was down the front of his pants when he suddenly snaps out of it and extracts his hand and and walks over to the road. Uh, are you okay in there, Doug? Sure, but just just need to get this door open. Yeah, 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 yeah. You stand back, stand back. And as he comes over, I kind of just look to the others and whisper just like, Get rid of the sandwich, quickly! What's wrong with the sandwich, Doug? I kind of blink at her and then look to the door. Bam! Bam! Frank Cobb is going to town on that door. I'll get, I'll get you out of there, Doug. Thanks, buddy. No worries. Uh, oh, what, what, Margo, what's that? It sounds like your fire alarm was going off or something. You gotta get that thing checked. Josh really needs to look after the house better. I look so disappointed. And I look so heartbroken. And I look so frustrated at Doug. And I'm gonna go and I'm gonna pick up that sandwich again. And, and I, don't, I don't even know where, where I'm supposed to take it. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know why Kevin's not moving. I don't understand why Doug doesn't see things the way we do. I, I think that's just going to wind up with me sitting there cradling the sandwich and staring at Doug with pure, unadulterated disappointment. Kevin, the banging from the front door does bring you, snap you out of your hypnotized state. You realize you still have the nozzle in one hand, the extinguisher in the other. And I, and I look at the oven, is it, is it still on fire? No, uh, there's still smoke belching from it. I'll, I'll put the fire extinguisher down and begin backing away, moving towards the the door, towards the front door. I have to open the front door. I have to let them in. Someone needs to get in. It can fix the oven. I think the oven's broken. As you put your hand to the door, Kevin... You remember one of those first rules of fire safety. Never put your palm to a door when there's a fire. Except, from your perspective, the fire should be behind you now. It should be in the house, should be in the kitchen. When you put your hand to the front door, probably like Nikolai did when his house was burning down, your hand is rendered into intense pain as for a moment there it is adhered to the surface of the door. You peel it off. Just like Nikolai Godzinski, the fire of course started outside his house. You made that circle, that wonderful flaming circle to burn him from the outside in. Like any good barbecue. And... Yeah, your hand goes through the same thing his hand did. Thankfully for you, even though you take a serious wound from that, you are able to back away. And there is no inferno waiting for you outside the house, at least not the inferno you think. Because as the door opens, Frank Cobb on the other side... Ah, Jesus... Kev, are you, are you okay? I, 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 some What's all this smoke? And he waves it. Come on, get out, get out. And, and I'm, I'm crawling out of the house. Uh, is there anybody else in here? Doug? Doug? I follow swiftly behind Kevin, although I do pause and just look at Margot and sort of just like, Margot, come on, come outside. Come outside. I nod. And still cradling this flesh sandwich like a newborn baby I'll walk out maybe it's luck or maybe it's a willing blindness but Frank doesn't look down at that sandwich once as he helps you out ah jeez Margo are your kids in here are they at school Josh at work oh Margo Margo and he starts snapping his finger in front of your face Margo are you no the kids are at school Josh is at work there's no one else in the house you, you having some kind of cookout, aren't you? <laughs> oh, it looks like it's easing off. There's no heat. Well, you know what they say about these ovens that aren't made in America, am I right? <laughs> he looks at you like you're some kind of idiot. Yeah, 
do you listen? Do you want me to call the uh, the fire? No, I mean, no, 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 no. It's fine. Like you said, it's 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 dialing back, right? It, it might be a broken fuse or um or silly me. The cleaner might have accidentally activated. You know how those ovens self clean? Oh yeah, I, I I understand, Mar- Margo. So. uh and he looks at the three of you now sat on the lawn getting your breath back uh, it would appear that uh, Duval who was also on the other side of the street just walked off didn't stick around to watch what would happen so you're here with Frank and Frank squats down so he's at your level uh, so uh, it's an old fire brigade huh? and he smiles almost as if he's been let in on a conspiracy I know it's a uh... We don't need to bother them with this. It's uh, it's it's fine now. Thanks to you, you uh, you really saved us, buddy. I say, and I, I look at my hand. That, that, that looks nasty. Uh, oh, Kevin! Kevin, you should. And Margot, do do you want me to not speak to Josh about this? And he winks. Frank, sweetie, go home. Oh, sure enough, he stands up, dusts off the front of his pants. I guess I'll uh, see you at the parade. Oh, wouldn't miss that for all the world. Anyway, I better be getting back to my place, I smile at the other two, and I just quietly say... Frank interrupts you, he actually puts his hand up walks over to Margot, reaches down toward the sandwich, pulls a bit of meat off <gasps> and sticks it in his mouth, chews it. Hmm. Huh. Funny kind of ham. And then he walks off. I blink a little, really trying to compartmentalise a lot that's happening, and I just look at the others and say... We need to talk later. We need to. I need to go home. I'm gonna go home. We're all gonna go home, and then we'll all talk this evening. Okay, this evening. Let's meet. Let's not meet at yours, Margot. Kevin, meet at your house. Okay, your house. That's great. Let's do that. Uh, all right. I slammed that sandwich into Doug's chest. You can take this back to Deborah. I intended to. Thank you, Margot. You want me to fire up the, the grill? No, Kevin. We don't need a... No, no fires! <laughs> and, um... I'll begin moving to my car. I, I need to get this looked at. It's gonna be tough driving home with just one hand, but... May I take you? I, mm, I'll take you. I'll take you. I don't want to be alone right now. Thank, thanks, Margo. I, I appreciate that. I, Someone needs to look at this. It's, um... It hurts like hell. Yeah. And I turn away, clutching that bloody sandwich, putting it back in its bag, and I immediately rush home. Need to sort out what's happening. I need answers. And I'm not going to get them from these two. Not yet, not yet. This is all highly, highly irritating. And even I can't deny that some weird shit just happened, and I don't like it. Very well. Margot, you and Kevin are driving now without Doug. It's rare that the two of you get time together. Genuinely quite rare. It's Doug is something of a linchpin. Maybe it's because he's the organizer among you, or the dictator. When you were small, when you all attended school together, He was often known as Il Duce, wandering around like Mussolini, puffing his chest out constantly, wearing all the highest fashions. But there was a charm to that. There was a... a certain charisma that Doug was able to carry off that attracted people to him, that made them dance to his tune. But right now it's the two of you in the car, Kevin nursing a badly burned hand 
I knew Margot nursing all kinds of mental trauma. Nursing all types of mental trauma. That is such a beautiful articulation for what I'm feeling. And in an attempt to nurse and process and unpack, I think I'm going to use this very valuable time that I have with Kevin to at least bring him up to speed on everything that I haven't been sharing with everyone else because I thought I was going crazy or I thought it was stress or I thought it was trauma or I thought it was... I don't know what it was. Okay. Walk me through what you've been seeing and I'll do the same. And I'll, I'll tell you about my wife turning into Nikolai and my son speaking to the man in the room and that being him and how he's coming for my family and how he's going to he's going to pay me back for what I did to him I'm scared Margo I, I'm scared for my family I'm scared too Kevin and in reverse uh, I will share that the original footage that I saw of the lumbering figure moving after the two girls that that figure looked like Nikolai Gazinski. I will share the entire encounter that happened at Doug's house with his wife, including the kiss and the and the thing that I saw on the bed. I'll explain the murder weapon. And after I have all of that out. I'm crying. I'm not sobbing, but, but tears are almost involuntarily pushing down my face, but that's not affecting my my driving. I'm still I'm still as present as I can be. You know, we 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 did the right thing, but, but it's as I said, I, I I think we're being punished. I think our sins are coming back to haunt us. We have to we have to ask for forgiveness somehow or put this thing to rest. But how do you do such a thing? Kevin, we don't... We don't believe in an Old Testament God anymore. The the New Testament is about... This is all bullshit. I don't feel bad about what we did, Kevin. I don't think we're being punished for what we did. We may be... We may, we may be being haunted by what we did, but I don't feel bad. I don't feel bad. I don't feel bad. I don't feel bad. We did what we needed to do. We did what we needed to do. Do you know what happened to the house? Where it happened? I mean, Nikolai's house. Did they build something new there? That was something that both Doug and yourself, Margo, oversaw. It was made into a memorial garden at first for the various children that had gone missing or been abused but that was the plan anyway I say it was made it got into the planning stages there was some assent from the council but then then it was largely talked down largely talked down by people like yourself because who wants to linger on that kind of misery who wants to be reminded of a time when vigilante justice was necessary or indeed of when a group of children suffered. The conclusion you came to was, no one wants that. And so, the council paid for the bulldozers to take down the wreckage of the house. And subsequently, a new house was built on top of it. It was quite difficult, actually, the first few years, because there was the big question of, well, we have all thought Godzinski actually owned the land. It wasn't just a house, but the land on it. So who owns it now? No one came forward. No relatives of Godzinski. It seems he was genuinely quite alone by the time you roasted him alive. So, in the end, the town got permission to build a new house 
and make it affordable. That stuck in some people's throats because it immediately meant that a family would arrive who weren't necessarily of the same income bracket, but at least it would be a house. It would blend in with the scenery. And maybe, maybe the wrong kind of people could be made into the right kind of people. Whether that's true or not is uh, another matter entirely, because the people that moved in, ultimately, were Mackenzie and Daniel Jefferson. They've been nothing but law-abiding. They've been nothing but community-spirited. Uh, indeed, they have been nothing but perfect neighbours. But there were doubts, as you know, and let's call it what it is, purely down to the colour of their skin. Maybe extending to their cultural background, though they brought none of that to Noveville. They remained quiet in the plot of land that Nikolai Godzinski's house once occupied. But they were your new neighbours. That's right. A, a new family lives there now. That's that's all right. That's all. It's all good. That, that part is perhaps at rest, then. But what about... What about the grave, then? I mean, we saw it. We both saw it. Did someone find the body? Is the body even still there? Perhaps we'd... We'd better go and... Make sure. Okay. Kevin. We need to get Doug... We need to get Doug back on our side. We can't do this alone. Yeah. Look, let's let, let, let's get me patched up and okay. Put some bandages on, and then then, then we'll get Doug, and then we'll, we'll head out into the woods, and we'll make sure that everything's at rest, like it's supposed to be. So you're heading to the Miller household to get your hand treated first, wrapped up, or well, treated with some ointment, wrapped up, etc. If nothing else, there's going to be a damn big blister on it. I, I figure I know what I'm doing. I should be able to just take care of it that way. It's Yeah. I don't need to head into the ER, right? It's not that kind of... No, no, it isn't quite that bad. I mean, it hurts, and it's going to hurt for quite some time. But you're not going to need skin grafts or anything like that. All right, well, that's good. Then I'll just... Then, yeah. Let, let's get back to my house, then. Oh, your time at your house with Margot is brief. Laura has made the school run, picked the kids up, and brought them home. Ronald is off doing his own thing. Laura is presumably doing the same. You encounter uh, Walker coming downstairs as you're heading up to get the medical bag from the upstairs bathroom. And he looks at you with some concern. Are you okay, Daddy? Oh, I just had a little accident. It's nothing to worry about. I just burned my hand a little bit. Uh, it's going to be fine. I just need to put some bandages on it. Uh, how are you doing, buddy? You had a had a good day? He looks sad at that. Have you been burning down neighbors' houses again? Um. What did you just say? He shrugs. I don't know. So, uh... Did, did you learn anything new in school today? Hmm. He walks past you down the stairs. Oh, he turns around. That's bad luck. Heads into the lounge to watch some TV. I'll move to get my hand taken care of. What was that? And then I remember that I know exactly what it is and who has told him. I have to put a stop to this before it goes any further, before before this becomes irreversible, before before he really finds out what I did. You shouldn't know that. He he's too he's too young for that. That's uh he, he's gonna understand one day, but 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 not for a long, long time. Margot, you're waiting out in the car. Your phone starts buzzing again. It's Josh. You can never be left alone with your thoughts, it seems. I will gather 
myself to the best of my ability. I will answer the phone. Hi, baby. Marg. I called earlier. Did you? Mm-hmm. I must have missed it. I'm sorry. I won't be home until late. So don't put a plate out for me. Are you home now? No. I'm... I'm hanging flyers up for the parade. Do you need me at home? No, oh, kids will let themselves in, won't they? Mark, the kids. Yes, they'll let themselves in. I'll be there. I'll be home shortly. Hmm. Are you okay? Run off my feet. A lot going on with the parade and all. Are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. Good. Good. I got the, uh... You can kind of hear his jaw working as he's... It's like he's processing the confidence to ask you a question. Uh, I got a, uh... Fucked up message on my phone, Mark. Don't know where it's from. You need to check in with your friends, make sure they're not telling people things they ought not tell. What type of message? Not a message I particularly wish to discuss over the phone, Marg, if you see what I mean. It's just... It's hard to support you if you don't give me the information that I need. God damn it, Mark. I... Someone messaged me saying they know where the, uh... where we were three nights ago. And it's not from a number I recognize. I obviously tried calling back. No answer. Who have you been speaking to? No one, baby. That means it's one of your dipshit friends, then. I'll talk to them. Immediately. Yeah, you, you better, because if this blows up... It won't. If this blows up... It won't. It won't. I'll take care of it. All right, I'll see you tonight. I love you. He disconnects. My hands are shaking on the phone. I'm shaking, and, and I, I look at the phone, and... You know, across the very bottom with the apps, the the call app, the text messaging app, there's a calendar app, and, and my eyes fall on the calendar app for a moment, and I think, is there any type of date significance about all of these events occurring right now from, from what we did with Nikolai Gazinski? You try to connect those dots in your head, you try to make sense of it that way, you try the fact is, you can't remember the exact date that happened. You would struggle at a push to be able to say how many years exactly it's been, let alone what day of what month. Strange how when you fold a memory away so tightly like you just have, now that it's getting unfurled, it just seems like every new revelation is opening a pocket that's been closed for, for years and years and years. About the only thing that stands out on your calendar is Steve Sanderson is coming to visit the town in but a couple of days. Steve Sanderson in big capital letters is coming to Novaville. Eyes on the prize, Margot. You can't let all of this stop you. Eyes on the prize. We have a target in sight. Eyes on the prize. We have a target in sight. 
Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. Okay. Eyes on the prize. Doug, you return home. Still wearing Josh's trousers, of course. And you did get the worst of the sick off of your shoes, though when it gets in the little lace holes, that's uh, that's more difficult. Of course, you've got this sandwich, unless you disposed of it on the way over. As much as I'd like to, no, you can't. Even though I know it's not what they said it was. Just in case it was, you can't just throw that in a bin. Not yet, anyway. No, I need it. I need evidence to talk to my wife. I need to compartmentalize. I need to get a handle on the situation. After all, things are spiraling out of control here, and I need to control them. I need to bring everyone together, and I need to lead us to better pastures. The worst thing of all is fucking Nikolai. Nikolai, that person from that long ago. Why did what brought this up with Kevin? I don't know. I just need to find my wife, get to the bottom of this, and also I very quickly check just to make sure that, well, obviously my my youngest son is at home, but I want to make sure Sally's not anywhere around. I need to talk to my wife in private. Well, Sally is around. She is in the living room with Deborah. Deborah appears to be helping Sally with her homework. Oh. Hi, hon. Deborah smiles. Hi, Dad. Hi, sweetie. Hi, Deborah. Do you mind if I just talk to you for a moment upstairs? Just something I need to uh, ask oh, I'm you. Ju- I'm just helping Sally with some of her math. Could you do it right? Could you hurry up? Could I... Uh, excuse me? It's something very important, Deborah. I need to talk to you. I'll, I'll wait upstairs till you're done, but it's just very important. Well, I think our daughter's education is very important, Doug. It's okay, Mum. No, 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 no. Well, the shine's off that apple. Deborah is no longer amorous, lascivious, nymphomaniac Deborah. She has her eyes narrowed as she stands up. So what's so important? Hmm? What's so important that you're interrupting my time with my daughter? I know you have things to do around the town. I know you're busy. But here you are again, trying to order me around. First it's don't drink too much. Now it's come upstairs so we can have a quiet conversation. Come on! Sally's right here. She's practically a grown-up. I'm eight. She's practically a grown-up. I let out a little sigh. I don't have time for this. I just turn round and walk upstairs. Oh, that's it. Walk off, Doug Kennedy. That's what you're good at, isn't it? Whenever things get too hot, you walk away. Well, you can make your own fucking dinner. I frown. I clench my fist a little and I walk up the stairs. I walk into our bedroom. And I just wait. She has to come up eventually. She can't not come to the bedroom for the rest of the entire night. She's going to come in here and speak. And I'm going to get an answer about what's in this fucking sandwich. And I'm not going to do it in front of Sally. You're sat there on the bed, holding this sandwich wrapped in greasy brown paper. Aware on some level of what's inside it. Doesn't matter how far you fool yourself, you're aware that there's something not right. But you're waiting a long time. Because Deborah has been dealing with you for a long time. She knows you're nothing but a sulking child when you can't get your way. She knows that you will just sit there and huff and puff. And you'll think that the silent treatment will do the job. But Deborah has lived through your shit. And so she feeds Sally her dinner. And she, of course, looks after Charlie. Charlie can't look after himself. 
and when it's time to put Charlie into his cot. And when it's time to tell Sally it's time to go to bed now. You of course expect Deborah to meekly enter the bedroom. But she doesn't. You hear the front door slam. I grip my teeth. I look at the sandwich. If it, what she's doing, this isn't... This can't be coincidental. Did she actually somehow have something to do with this? I didn't want to do this. If it's true... If she somehow found the body, if she's doing some sort of sick revenge game against me, it doesn't make any sense, but if she's lost her mind, which, again, Margot said something about her acting weird, I have to think of the children. Ah, oh, shit. I know people. I know people at the hospital. I know people who you can ring to make sure someone has a nice stay in a padded room for their own safety, but God... Damn it. No, I... I stop myself, and I hear the door slam. I run out. I, I, I get out of the room, and I just run out onto the street. She is climbing into your car. I'm going for a drive. Deborah, what did you put in the sandwich? What? I shove the sandwich. Get the fuck off me! What did you put in the sandwich, Deborah? She Deborah, bats you... it out of your hand. You need to... Deborah, if you've ever trusted me in your life, which you used to, you used to, I need you, I need you to tell me the truth, or you and I are in a lot of trouble. People are emerging onto their verandas. Your neighbour who is watering his garden pointedly turns the hose off and takes a lean on a fence post. Everyone is interested in this. You want to know what's wrong, Doug? Is that what you want? Would you like your neighbours, our neighbours, to hear everything that's wrong with this relationship, this marriage, this sham? Hmm? I look around. I see everyone watching, and I realize, no, it's all over. I can't confront her about this here, and I need to look after the children. So for now, I'll just say, I give her, a, honestly, quite a sad look. Oh, you're right, Deborah. I'll take care of everything. Sorry. I turn... I walk back into the house, and I'm going to find that phone call. I need to have a section for the children. It's going to destroy my reputation, but better I deal with her now than get her... I don't know. She, she clearly has lost her mind. She clearly didn't actually do this, but if she did, I don't want her going to jail. So I gotta do this now. A nice sectioning. I know some good people. They'll put her in a place. She'll hate it, but... If it protects her from what could happen, and protects her from the children, I, I, need to, I need to do it. I need to do it. God damn it. God damn it! As you pick up your phone and make to dial for the hospital, you see a name flash up. Steve Sanderson is calling you. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we play the scenario Tapestry of Suburbia, from the scenario collection The Forbidden, for Cult Divinity Lost. Cult Divinity Lost is published by Helmgast, who have also sponsored this series. Joining us as players in this series are none other than Bridget Jeffries from Symphony Entertainment and our dear friend Matthew Dawkins. The music was made by Atrium Carceri, featuring a number of collaborations with other artists, and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Check out their website at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for some moody dark ambient for your gaming table. 
We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon. Martin Hoyshobert, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, Bob Lange, Cameron, Anton, and Graham Berry for their generous support. And would of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Anity Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember that community is everything.